Why does the Lord forbid the preaching that he is the Christ? Why does the Lord forbid the preaching that he is the Christ? One of the things that is noticeable in the four Gospels is that there is preaching that Jesus is the Christ, and then there's a point where the Lord forbids the preaching that he is the Christ. In this study, we're going to try to understand why that is. There are two sections that we will cover. The first is the content of the gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The second, I'm going to call the puzzle. And so in the second section, we'll look at this puzzle. Let's start with the first section. The content of the gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Look with me at Matthew 26, verse 63. Matthew 26, 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, comma, the Son of God. The term Christ refers to the Son of God. So when we speak of Jesus Christ, we are speaking of Jesus, who is the Son of God. Get with me John chapter 1, verse 29. What we're going to see is that the content of the gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In other words, when someone preached the gospel of the kingdom, they were declaring, Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. He is the Son of God. John 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 30. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. In other words, John, John testified, he gave testimony that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, the Christ. John chapter 6, verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? So, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Verse 69, And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Get with me John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Verse 27, She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Get Acts 19, verse 4. Acts 19, verse 4. We've looked at just a couple verses here. We'll look at one more. Acts 19, verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, here's what John preached, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So what have all of those verses shown us? When the gospel of the kingdom was being preached, the content of it, in other words, what people preached was they preached that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. He was the Son of God that had long been promised. Now one thing that's interesting is while the gospel of the kingdom includes the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
it does not include his death, burial, and resurrection. Look with me at Matthew 16, verse 21. Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Verse 21 is talking about the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Lord, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now think about this just for a minute. Peter is one of the twelve. He's the leader of the twelve. When the Lord specifically tells him about the death, burial, and resurrection, Peter responds saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. Well, that demonstrates that Peter wasn't preaching the cross because he actually says, Be it far from thee, Lord. Get Mark 9, verse 31. Mark 9, verse 31. Now, while you're getting Mark 9, 31, I'm just going to make this point. What we often do is we look backward to the cross and we understand that Jesus was the Christ and we understand that he was going to die on the cross and that he was going to be buried and he was going to be raised the third day. All of those things are, are very clear. And we sometimes then think, well, that, that's clear. So the 12, they, they must have understood that because it's so clear to us. But when you actually read the gospel accounts, it was not clear to them. It's clear to us in hindsight as we look back, but the death, burial, and resurrection was not something that the twelve believed or something that the twelve preached before the cross. Mark 9, verse 31. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. The Lord is telling them about his death and resurrection before it happens. Verse 32, But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him. They didn't understand of his death. They didn't understand of his resurrection. Luke 18, verse 31. Luke 18, verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. He's talking about his betrayal, he's going to be put to death, he's going to be scourged, he's going to rise again. He's telling them exactly about the events of the cross and the resurrection. Verse 34, And they understood None of these things, not one. They didn't understand any of it. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. They just didn't have any understanding of the cross and the resurrection. John 2, verse 19. John 2, verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. See, they didn't really understand what he was telling them. Look at verse 22. When therefore he was risen from the dead, so this is much later, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. See, they didn't understand it at the time, and they didn't believe it at the time. But later... After he resurrected, they believed it, according to John 2, 22. Get John 20, verse 9. John chapter 20, verse 9. Now in John 20, the two disciples run to the tomb. Notice what John 20, verse 9 says. For as yet, this is when they're at the tomb, they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now think about that. When the, when the two disciples are at the tomb and the resurrection has in fact already occurred, the body is not there, the stone is rolled away, they still did not understand the resurrection. Well, if they didn't understand the resurrection after it happened, then obviously they didn't understand it before it happened. And that's why with all those verses, and we've seen them from both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
The disciples, although they understood that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, they did not understand his death, burial, and resurrection. What that tells you is that when the gospel of the kingdom was preached, it didn't include the death, burial, and resurrection. It did include that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. Now let's go to section two, and this is what I'm going to call the puzzle, and I'll show you why it's a puzzle. When it becomes time for the Lord to go to the cross, he tells his disciples not to preach that he is the Christ. Let me say that again. As the Lord is preparing to go to the cross, he tells the disciples, don't tell anyone that I'm the Christ. So let's look at some verses on this. Mark, uh, actually Matthew, Matthew 16, verse 20. Matthew 16, verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now remember, we've just seen the gospel of the kingdom is the preaching that Jesus is the Christ. When he sent the twelve out to preach the gospel of the kingdom, he sent them out to preach that he was the Christ, the Son of God. But here in Matthew 16, 20, he charges them and he says, tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. That seems strange, doesn't it? Well, let's look at verse 21. From that time forth, so this is at a very specific, specific time element. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Get Mark 8, 27. Mark 8, verse 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Who do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others, one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said, saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. So notice what's happening here. The Lord asked his disciples, and he says, Who do people think that I am? And they respond and say, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elias, which is Elijah, some say you're a different one of the prophets, been resurrected. He says, well, okay, that's what they say. What do you say, 12? What, what, who do you think I am? And Peter specifically says, thou art the Christ. You're the Son of God that was promised. Now notice verse 30. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. Again, when he sent out the twelve before, they were sent to preach the gospel of the kingdom. So why is he telling them not to preach the gospel of the kingdom? That seems strange, doesn't it? Well, notice verse 31. And he began to teach them. He hadn't taught them this before. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Get Luke 9, verse 18. Luke 9, verse 18. Luke 9, 18. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist. But some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. Verse 20, He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. They, the, the, the twelve understand that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Verse 21, And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. Verse 22, Saying the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be slain and be raised the third day. Now, if you're paying close attention to this, this is a puzzle. This is something that is kind of confusing. We saw that the content of the gospel of the kingdom is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The Lord sent out the twelve to preach the kingdom. He sent them out to preach 
that he was the Christ, the Son of God. But then we find these passages in the middle of the Gospels, Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9, where the Lord says, don't tell anyone that I'm the Christ. Well, Lord, what do you, didn't you just send us out to preach that in all kinds of different places? Why are you now telling us not to preach you're the Christ? Because we just did that because you told us to. Well, what's the explanation for that? Notice that in all three passages where the Lord told them not to preach that he is the Christ, in the very following verse, from that time forth, and he began to teach, he starts telling them some new information. And what he tells them is that the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, he's going to be killed, and he's going to rise again the third day. So that new information is somehow connected with the Lord's instruction, tell no man that I am the Christ. But why is that? We'll get Numbers 35. We're going to have to look at a couple things here to understand this. Get Numbers 35 and verse 31. What we're going to see in Numbers 35 is this. The Old Testament provides different punishments for murder and manslaughter. The Old Testament has different punishments for murder and manslaughter. Murder is a premeditated, intentional killing. Manslaughter is an unintentional or unknowing killing. In both murder and manslaughter, someone dies. But with murder, it's premeditated and intentional. With manslaughter, it is unknowing. It is unintentional. The murderer, under the Old Testament law, had to be put to death. But the manslaughterer could flee to a city of refuge. So Numbers 35, 31. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. The murderer had to be put to death. Verse 22, Numbers 35, 22. But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or have cast upon him anything without laying of weight, in other words, it wasn't premeditated, or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm. You see the difference there? See verses 22, 23, 24, it says, without laying of weight. He wasn't waiting and ready to pounce. It wasn't premeditated. Then it says, seeing him not. So in other words, someone was throwing the stone or doing something and they didn't see the person there. It wasn't intentional was not his enemy, and then it says, neither sought his harm. In other words, it wasn't a desire, it wasn't an intention to kill the person. Verse 24, Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. Verse 25, And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest, which was anointed with the holy oil. So let's pull that together. Under the Old Testament law, a murderer and a manslaughterer are treated differently. The murderer has to be put to death because it was an intentional premeditated killing. The manslaughterer he didn't know. He didn't seek his harm. It was accidental or unknowing in some way. Well, that person could flee to the city of refuge, and he would stay in the city of refuge until what event? The death of the high priest. Get with me Luke 23, verse 34. Luke 23, verse 34. What we're now going to look at is we're going to look at some verses that talk about 
what people understood right before the cross. And what we're going to see is that the chief priests and the scribes and much of Israel understood that they were killing Jesus of Nazareth, a man. But they did not understand or believe they were killing the Son of God. Let me say that again. As you think about what happens right before the cross, the chief priest, the scribes, much of Israel, they understand that they're putting a man to death. They understand that they're, when they say crucify him, they know that they are desiring that Jesus of Nazareth be put to death. But what they do not understand is they do not understand that they are killing the Son of God. Luke 23, verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, the Lord wasn't lying. He wasn't just saying something that wasn't true. He, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke the truth. So when he says, for they know not what they do, there's something they didn't know. Well, did they know they were putting a man to death? They, they had to know that. That was obvious. But what they didn't understand is they didn't understand exactly who he was. Look at verse 35. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. See, what they're saying there is they didn't really think he was the Christ. If you're really the Christ, you'd have the power to deliver yourself. You're obviously not the Christ. See, it is said mockingly. I'm not saying it isn't, but they don't think he's the Christ. That's what the Lord meant when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They didn't understand. Get Mark 14, verse 61. Mark 14 and verse 61. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? So he asks him specifically, Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? Well, the Lord received a specific question. Notice what he says. Verse 62, And Jesus said, I am. So the question is, Are you the Christ? Christ says, I am. He's telling him flat out, I am the Son of God. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now notice verse 63. Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. What the high priest does is he asks them the question. Now, now if you recall, when the Lord is put on trial, the witnesses don't agree with themselves, and they can't find anything to convict him of. So the high priest says to him, Are you the Christ? He puts to him the question, Are you the Son of God? Well, Jesus Christ wasn't going to tell a lie. So he says, I am. I am the Christ. And what does the high priest do? The high priest rends his clothes and says, Well, this is blasphemy. You're claiming to be the Christ. In other words, the high priest did not believe the statement. He didn't say, well, if you're the Christ, then we got to let you go, because obviously the Christ is, is sinless, and we can't be putting the, the, the Son of God on trial. He didn't say that. What he said was, you just committed blasphemy because you made a false claim. You claim to be the Christ, but we all know you're not. And what happens? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Every one of them that was observing this, they saw him say, I am, and their immediate thought was, no, you're not. They did not believe that he was the Christ. Look with me at John 7, verse 25. John 7, verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? 
See, some of those in Jerusalem say, this guy's speaking very boldly. Do the rulers, do they know that he's the Christ? Do they understand that? Now notice verse 27. How be it, we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Now that logic is faulty. What they're saying is, we know where this man is from. We know he's from Bethlehem and so on. We know the details of his background. When the Christ comes, no man knoweth whence he is. No man knows where he's from. So this guy obviously is not the Christ. Now that reasoning is totally wrong. It's illogical. It's unscriptural. It's fake. But what that shows is the chief priests and the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel, they believed that. In other words, they did not think he was the Christ. Now, it was, a, it was a mistaken rationale, but they didn't think he was the Christ. They didn't think he was. Get Acts 2, 36. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now in Acts 2, Peter's speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's making the point that, that God hath made that same Jesus. In other words, the Jesus of Nazareth. He's pointing out to them, the Jesus of Nazareth, whom ye have crucified, he was both Lord and Christ. He was the Lord, and he was Christ, the Son of God. Notice verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now notice what went on there. So in Acts 2, we're obviously after the crucifixion, we're after the resurrection. Peter tells the crowd, he tells them, Understand, Jesus of Nazareth, God made him both the Lord and Christ. This is revelation to them because they didn't previously believe that. They didn't think he was the Christ. Verse 37, when they heard this, they're learning it. They now recognize it to be true. They're pricked in their heart, and they said, what shall we do? Now think about this just for a moment. Israel had stoned lots of Old Testament prophets. They'd done that a lot. They knew that. It wasn't a good thing, but they knew that. Peter now says, you need to understand, you didn't just kill a prophet. What you did this time is you killed the Lord and the Christ. And Israel realizes, we got a serious problem. We've stoned prophets in the past. God was willing to forgive us for that. But you know what we did this time? We actually killed his son. The son of God, we killed the Lord. That's why they're pricked in their heart. They say, what shall we do? they realized that what happened at the cross was far worse than stoning a prophet. What that tells you is they didn't know beforehand. They didn't realize before the cross that he was the Christ. Acts 3, verse 12. Acts chapter 3, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. Skip down to verse 15. And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. So he's talking in verse 15 about the killing of Jesus Christ, the prince of life. Notice what Peter says in verse 17. And now, brethren, I wot. That's a way of saying, I know. I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. Well, that couldn't be more clear. When Israel killed Jesus Christ, the Son of God, how did they do it? They did it through ignorance, and it wasn't only the, the, the vast majority of the people of Israel. Who else was it? It was their rulers. So it's clear from all of those verses that the leadership of Israel and the vast majority of Israel did not know, did not believe 
that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. So here's how this all fits together. Before the cross, God in his immense wisdom and his grace chose to conceal from the vast majority of Israel the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. During the early preaching of the gospel of the kingdom, they preached that Jesus was the Christ. But when it comes time for the Lord to go to the cross, he forbids the preaching that he was the Christ. He told them to tell no man. He told them to tell no man because he didn't want them to know. Therefore, when they killed him, they would be guilty of killing Jesus of Nazareth. They would be guilty of killing the carpenter's son, the man. They understood that they were killing a man. But they would not be guilty of killing the capital S Son of God because they didn't realize that Jesus was the Christ. So what God did is he had the twelve, he had the disciples not preach that information so that Israel could be in ignorance and therefore God could forgive them. If you remember, under the Old Testament law, the murderer shall be surely put to death. There was no forgiveness for murder. But the manslaughterer could obtain forgiveness because he did it unintentionally. He did it unknowingly. This reminds me of Romans 11, verse 33. Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Well, due to Israel engaging in the manslaughter of the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel needed to flee to a city of refuge. Then, after the death of the high priest, the manslaughterer is allowed to return to the land of his possession. Well, once the Lord Jesus Christ, who was Israel's ultimate high priest, once he died, Israel could then return to the land of its possession. Get Numbers 35 and verse 28. Numbers 35 and verse 28. Because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. So the, the manslaughterer, he flees to the city of refuge and he stays there until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. Get Joshua chapter 20 and verse 2. Joshua chapter 20 and verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly, that's what Israel did with the Son of God because they were unaware and unwittingly they didn't know it. And unwittingly may flee thither and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. Verse 5, And if the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time. Verse 6, and he shall dwell in that city until he stand before the congregation for judgment, and, and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return and come unto his own city and unto his own house, unto the city from whence he fled. Get Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews 3.1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and capital H high, capital P priest of our profession, Christ Jesus.
obviously the Lord Jesus Christ was Israel's ultimate high priest. So how does this all fit together? Well, we now see how to understand those puzzling verses in the Gospels where the Lord tells the disciples not to preach that he is the Christ, even though the message of the gospel of the kingdom was that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. What the Lord did is right before the cross, he knew he had to go to the cross because he knew that he had to die for the sins of Israel. He knew he had to do that. But he also knew that after he died for their sins, he wanted to forgive them. So what he did is he told the disciples, for this period of time, tell no one that I am the Christ. After I rise from the dead, you'll preach that I am the Christ, but don't do it right now. Because right now, don't tell Israel that I am the Christ, so that when the cross occurs, the crucifixion will be unknowing. They will do it through ignorance because they won't understand that I'm the Son of God. Then I'll die for their sins, I'll rise from the dead, and then you will preach forgiveness on the basis of what I have done for them, and I will be able to forgive them because they did it through ignorance. They did it unknowingly. Praise God for His great wisdom. Praise God for His great grace. Praise God for designing things so that He died for the sins of all men and ensured that He could still forgive them. Hallelujah.